This is Lecture by Robert Vinoy on the Major Prophets. This is Lecture number 25, but we begin our lectures on Ezekiel. So Lecture 25 of the Major Prophets, but the first lecture on Ezekiel. Let's go to the prophet Ezekiel and to our outline, and notice capital A of the outline, which is Introductory Remarks. I think in general we could say Ezekiel is one of the neglected books of the Old Testament. I think Isaiah and Daniel, and probably even Jeremiah of the four major prophets, receive far more attention than does Ezekiel. Perhaps the reason for this is that Ezekiel, I think, requires a knowledge of the historical background for understanding what's going on in the book, and maybe more so than the other prophets I mentioned. There's a lot of symbolism in the book, and that means that it's hard to interpret it. In addition, when you look at the first chapter, you immediately get hit with symbolic material. You have that picture of the throne chariot of God with the wheels within the wheels. You have the visionary experience of Ezekiel, and this is something that's quite remote from what most of us have ever experienced, and frankly, from what a lot of the other prophets experienced as well. I think a lot of people read something like that and they just can't get any further when trying to work through the book and find what it means. I will say, if people do look at the book, however, it is mostly at the last parts of it. Chapters 34 to 39, perhaps to some extent, but particularly chapters 40 to 48, where you have the description of a future temple, Ezekiel's temple will name it. But exactly how that's interpreted, again, is a matter of a great deal of controversy. Most people pay very little attention to the first two-thirds of the book. They're eager to get to the prophecy in chapter 40 and on. So the first two-thirds of the book deal more with Ezekiel's own situation. When you get to the latter part of the book, you're dealing with the future, and that seems to be what interests most people. The book has a chronological structure to it, and I'll say more about that later. But let's begin with the second verse in the book, where you read the following. On the fifth of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiachin, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, by the Kibar River in the land of the Babylonians. The hand of the Lord was upon him. That's the end of the quote. So Ezekiel is in captivity. He's exiled in Babylon, along with a number of other people from Judah, and this vision comes to him on the fifth day of the month in the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity. The date of that would be 593 B.C. We know the date of the reigns of the kings of Israel and Judah quite well, so we can pin it down to 593 B.C. Notice the first verse also has a rather cryptic statement that is included with the chronological material, but it's hard to know exactly what it's talking about. It says, and I quote here, In the thirtieth year, in the fourth month of the fifth day, while I was among the exiles by the Kibar River, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. End quote. In the thirtieth year, fourth month, fifth day of the month, but it doesn't say 30th year of what. It's reasonable to conjecture that it's the 30th year of his life, and he is 30 years old at the time of this prophecy. That's probably the way it is to be understood. If that's the case, then we know the age of Ezekiel in 593 B.C., because the second verse gives you the date, which we determine to be 593. Now, if you take that second verse with the 593 B.C. date in connection with what we learn from Kings and Chronicles as far as historical background goes, that gives you a good background for the book of Ezekiel. Let's think about that for a moment, just briefly. In 597 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar took into captivity a great number of people of Judah, including this young king Jehoiachin, that we have read about, and he had only reigned three months at the time of his captivity. Then Nebuchadnezzar put Zedekiah on the throne in Judah. Zedekiah was Jehoiachin's uncle. You find that in Second Kings chapter 24, verse 10 and following. 
And I read that. At that time, the officers of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, advanced on Jerusalem and laid siege to it, and Nebuchadnezzar himself came up to the city while his officers were besieging it. Jehoiachin, king of Judah, his mother, his attendants, his nobles, and his officials all surrendered to him. In the eighth year of the reign of the king of Babylon, he took Jehoiachin prisoner. As the Lord had declared, Nebuchadnezzar removed all the treasures from the temple of the Lord and from the royal palace and took away all the gold articles that Solomon, king of Israel, had made for the temple of the Lord. He carried into exile all Jerusalem, all the officers and fighting men, and all the craftsmen and artisans, a total of ten thousand. Only the poorest people of the land were left. Nebuchadnezzar took Jehoiachin captive to Babylon. He also took from Jerusalem to Babylon the king's mother, his wives, his officials, and the leading men of the land. The king of Babylon also deported to Babylon the entire force of 7,000 fighting men, strong and fit for war, and a thousand craftsmen and artisans. He made Mataniah, Jehoiachin's uncle, king in his stead, and changed his name to Zedekiah. End quote. So that's in 597 B.C., and you're down now to 593, the fifth year of Jehoiachin's reign, according to the second verse in Ezekiel. Now, there were a number of deportations in this general time frame in Judah. The first of them goes back a bit earlier to 605-604 B.C., depending on which chronology you follow. In 2 Kings, chapter 24, verse 1, you have the earliest one. I'm reading from that passage. During Jehoiakim's reign, notice the difference Jehoiakim versus Jehoiachin. Jehoiachin was Jehoiakim's son. During Jehoiakim's reign, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, invaded the land, and Jehoiakim became his vassal for three years. But then he, being Jehoiakim, changed his mind, and rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. The Lord sent Babylonian, Aramean, Moabite, and Ammonite raiders against him, end quote, and so forth. In that 605 B.C. deportation, Daniel himself went to Babylon, Daniel the prophet. You find that Daniel and Ezekiel are roughly contemporaries. Daniel preceded Ezekiel into captivity in Babylon, Ezekiel, as a matter of fact, refers to Daniel if you look at Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 14. And it says, Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they could save only themselves by their righteousness. End quote. That's Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 14. And then down in verse 20, we have another reference to Daniel. And I'm quoting. As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, even if Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they could save neither son nor daughter. End quote. You don't have any references in Daniel to Ezekiel, but you do have an Ezekiel reference to Daniel. Although some have argued that the Daniel referenced in Ezekiel is an ancient figure referred to by Ugaritic sources as Daniel. I have doubts about that, however. But in 605 B.C., you have the first deportation. Then the second one is in 597, where Ezekiel is taken to Babylon along with Jehoiachin and about 10,000 Jews. Then, of course, the final deportation and destruction of Jerusalem is in 586 B.C., which is related to us in 2 Kings chapter 25, verses 8-21. to so he had a series of three deportations as the Jews struggled against Babylonian domination, but by 586 B.C. Jerusalem was destroyed, and you get the final deportation to Babylon and destruction of the first temple. If you look at 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 34, you read the following. Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, son of Josiah, king in place of his father Josiah, and changed Eliakim's name to Jehoiakim. End quote. That again is Second Kings chapter 23, verse 34. And then in the same chapter, in verse 35, you read, 
Jehoiakim paid Pharaoh Necho the silver and gold he demanded. In order to do so, he taxed the land and exacted the silver and the gold from the people of the land according to their assessments. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. End quote. And then 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 1 says, and I'm quoting here, During Jehoiakim's reign, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, invaded the land, and Jehoiakim became his vassal for three years. End quote. And so his allegiance switches from paying tribute to Egypt to paying tribute to Babylon. And then we read in verse 5 that Jehoiakim died. Now, Jehoiachin was taken into captivity, but in the end of the book of Kings, he is released. In fact, you see, that's where I wanted to go with this, even though Zedekiah is put on the throne in place of Jehoiachin. Often you think of Zedekiah as being the last king of Judah. The Jewish people did not really share this view. To them, Jehoiachin was the legitimate king. It was their expectation that Zedekiah's rule was going to be a temporary thing. They expected that Jehoiachin would return to Judah and resume his reign, and Judah would be an independent state again. That's what the Jewish people wanted. Zedekiah was sort of an illegitimate appointee of this foreign power. Jehoiachin was really the legitimate king in the minds of the people. Most of those Jewish people at this time were very patriotic. They desired to return to their homeland. They desired the independence that Judah would have from Babylon eventually. I'm sure you could understand those feelings. But then you see Ezekiel's task is quite difficult for which the Lord calls Ezekiel to be a prophet. What he has to tell them in exile is that this is not temporary. This is not just a temporary misfortune. It's not something that's going to be over shortly, but it's only just begun. Things are going to get worse, not better. This is in 597 B.C. when he goes to captivity, and it's 593 when he gets this vision that we read about in the first chapter. All this, of course, is before 586 B.C. when the real crushing blow falls on Jerusalem. So Ezekiel has to warn the people in exile, and certainly his message carries back to Judah and to Jerusalem as well. Ezekiel has to tell Judah that they would again be overrun, and that Jerusalem would be destroyed, and that their homeland would be totally devastated. He tells them that most of them would end up living in captivity, hundreds of miles away from home. The natural reaction of most people would be to look at Ezekiel as being unpatriotic, or as a traitor, or as a collaborator with the Babylonians. There was another problem in this historical background that Ezekiel had to face as well as the people of that time. When the Babylonians took Jerusalem and took the king captive, it was very easy to conclude that the gods of Babylon were greater than the god of Israel. The common conception of that time was that the god of a country that was victorious in battle was the more powerful deity. Ezekiel and these 10,000 people taken to Babylon watch the processions in Babylon of these Babylonian deities and the worship at these Babylonian temples, which, by the way, were very elaborate. They could be impressed with the greatness of Marduk, which is a Babylonian deity, or Nabu, another Babylonian deity, a god who could not even protect his own headquarters, as it were, Jerusalem and the temple, could be thought of to be a god with not a great deal of power or significance. So Ezekiel has to tell these exiles that the temple in Jerusalem is soon to be destroyed, that's part of his message, and that there would be very little left in any visible way to give assurance of the existence of the God of Israel. I think that is quite possibly the reason for the first chapter. In chapter 1, Ezekiel gets this vision of the glory and the power of the God of Israel. It is very impressive, indeed a very impressive picture of the God of Israel. Certainly the vision made Ezekiel himself conscious of God's existence and power. Let's just look at some of the sections of the first chapter, verse 4 and following. I quote, 
I looked, and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning and surrounded by brilliant light. The center of the fire looked like glowing metal, and in the fire it was what looked like four living creatures. In appearance, their form was like that of a man, but each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, their feet were like those of a calf, and gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had the hands of a man. All four of them had faces and wings, and their wings touched one another. Each one went straight ahead. They did not turn as they moved. End quote. Now let's go down to verse 15, and I'm quoting again. As I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the ground besides each creature with its four faces. This was the appearance and structure of the wheels. They sparkled like chrysolite, and all four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in any one of the four directions the creatures faced. The wheels did not turn about as the creatures went. The rims were high and awesome, and all four rims were full of eyes all around. End of quote of verse 15. The description goes further in chapter 1, verse 22 and following, again quoting, Spread out above the heads of the living creatures was what looked like an expanse, sparkling like ice and awesome. Under the expanse their wings were stretched out, one towards the other, and each had two wings covering its body. When the creatures moved, I heard the sound of their wings, like the roar of rushing waters, like the voice of the Almighty, like the tumult of an army. When they stood still, they lowered their wings. Then there came a voice from above the expanse over their heads as they stood with lowered wings. Above the expanse over their heads was what looked like a throne of sapphire, and high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up he looked like glowing metal, as if full of fire, and that from there down he looked like fire and brilliant light surrounded him. End quote. Then in the last verse of the chapter you see, quote, Like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down, and I heard the voice of one speaking. End quote. And then you have the call, and I quote again, He said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak to you. End quote and he's commissioned to give God's word to his people. Certainly that vision of the greatness of the glory of the Lord in the first chapter made an enormous impact on Ezekiel. He refers back to this vision numerous times in the course of his prophecy. I think what he sees is the glory and splendor of the God of Israel, and that far surpasses any of the glory and splendor of the gods of Babylon. So Israel has been taken into exile, not because the gods of Babylon were stronger, but because the Lord chose to chastise his people, to bring judgment because of their sins and disobedience. So that's a historical background. Let's go to the book structure, still under introductory remarks in the outline. I think the book divides into these particular sections. In the first three chapters, you have Ezekiel's vision of God and his call. The first chapter is the vision, and then his calling is in chapters 2 and 3. In chapters 4 to 24, you have messages foretelling and justifying God's intention to bring judgment on Jerusalem. This is leading up to the climax of 586 B.C., which is the judgment on Jerusalem. Then in chapters 25 to 32, we have prophecies against four nations. I'll make some comments about that later, the way that fits into the chronology of things, but he turns from a focus on Judah and Jerusalem to prophecies against four nations in chapters 25 to 32. Then you have chapters 33 to 48, and this is prophecies concerning Israel's future restoration. Instead of looking to the immediate future and the imminent judgment, he turns to the more distant future after that judgment's been realized and speaks of future restoration of Judah. So those are the four basic types of material in the book, and that's all under A of the outline 
Introductory Remarks Let's go on to Capital B of the outline, which is General Survey of Chapters 1 to 24. I'm not going to do much with Chapters 1 to 24. 1 to 24 really divides into two sections, his vision and his call in Chapters 1 to 3, and then in verses 4 to 24, these messages about the coming judgment on Jerusalem. I think you're all aware that in those messages, Ezekiel not only speaks, he also acts out symbolically with a number of actions that certainly speak of the coming judgment on Jerusalem. What I think is interesting is to note when the actual siege of Jerusalem begins. Note at chapter 24, verse 1 and 2, it is right at the end of that second section, and we read, in the ninth year, in the tenth month, on the tenth day, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, record this date, this very date, because the king of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem this very day. End quote. Then if you go to Second Kings, chapter 25, verses 1 and 2, you read the following. So in the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, on the tenth day of the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, marched against Jerusalem with his whole army. He camped outside the city and built siege works all around it. The city was kept under siege until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. But well, you see, when the actual siege of Jerusalem begins, Ezekiel changes his message. He does not continue to denounce the wickedness of those people and say, See, I told you so, you're getting what you deserve, or anything like that. You see, it's at this point that he switches to prophecies against four nations. So during that period where Jerusalem is under siege and being destroyed, Ezekiel's message shifts. What he has been saying all along is now coming to reality, and now he moves on to something else. Ezekiel directs his prophecy against the four nations in chapters 25 to 32. Then the messenger comes to tell that the city had actually fallen. This we read in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 21. And I quote, In the twelfth year of our exile, in the tenth month, on the fifth day, a man who had escaped from Jerusalem came to me and said, The city has fallen. That's Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 21. Once again, his messages switch. Chapters 33 to 48 focus now on the future. The judgment has come, and now he brings messages concerning restoration. So there's a certain relationship between the structure of the book and the focus of the messages and the chronology you see of what's coming and the history of what's happening correlate with respect to what's going on in Jerusalem. I think that helps understand the structure of the book. You have the statement in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 22, quote, now the evening before the man arrived, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he opened my mouth before the man came to me in the morning. So my mouth was opened, and I was no longer silent. End quote. And then in verse 26 of chapter 3 you read, I will make your tongue stick to the roof of your mouth, so that you will be silent and unable to rebuke them, though they are a rebellious house. End quote. That's a difficult statement to know exactly how to take it. I think it's possible that he was unable to speak except when the Lord came to him with a specific message. In other words, it does seem that those messages between chapters 3 and 24 were the only messages that were delivered, but maybe he wasn't able to speak otherwise until the judgment on Jerusalem was completed. The New International Version, or the NIV Study Bible, makes a note there that says, quote, His silence underscored Israel's stubborn refusal to take God's word seriously. This condition was relieved only after the fall of Jerusalem. And that's the end of the quote from the NIV Study Bible note. So I don't know, but it's probably a reasonable way to understand that. Some think that he may have had to lie on his side for an hour or so each day for 490 days. Not that he was out there all day long, but for a period of that number of days. Others think that he may have given some indication that he maybe had a sign, maybe day one, day two, day three on the sign, and he ran through a number of days in a lesser period of time. I don't know. 
It seems that to think that he actually lay on his side 490 consecutive days all day long is not impossible, but one wonders if maybe he just lay there for just a period of time each day for those no 490 days. There are prophecies against four nations that wouldn't have taken necessarily that long to give them. We read, So in the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, and the tenth day of the tenth month, that's Second Kings chapter 25, verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, marched against Jerusalem with his whole army. He encamped outside the city and built siege works all around it. The city was kept under siege until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. By the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine in the city had become so severe that there was no food left for the people to eat, End quote. and so on. So you go from the ninth year to the eleventh year of Zedekiah, so it was fairly lengthy, two-year siege. Let's go on to Ezekiel chapter 25 to 32. I want to look at a few passages here. That's in this section of Judgment Against Four Nations. There are some interesting prophecies there. The first one that I would like to look at with you is in chapter 26. I think we should read the chapter, at least the first 14 verses. This is Ezekiel 26, which is a prophecy against Tyre. And I have a rather lengthy quote here. In the eleventh year, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, because Tyre has said of Jerusalem, Aha! The gate to the nations is broken, and its doors have swung open for me. Now that she lies in ruin, I will prosper. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I am against you, O Tyre, and I will bring many nations against you, like the sea casting up its waves. They will destroy the walls of Tyre and pull down her towers. I will scrape away her rubble and make her a bare rock. Out in the sea she will become a place to spread fish nets, for I have spoken, declares the Sovereign Lord. She will become plunder for the nations, and her settlements on the mainland will be ravaged by the sword. Then they will know that I am the Lord. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says. From the north I am going to bring against Tyre Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, king of kings, with horses and chariots, with horsemen and a great army. He will ravage your settlements on the mainland with a sword. He will set up siege works against you, build a ramp up to your walls, and raise his shields against you. He will direct the blows of his battering rams against your walls and demolish your towers with his weapons. His horses will be so many that they will cover you with dust. Your walls will tremble at the noise of the war horses, the wagons, the chariots, when he enters your gates as men enter a city whose walls have been broken through. The hooves of his horses will trample all of your streets. He will kill your people with the sword, and your strong pillars will fall to the ground. They will plunder your wealth and loot your merchandise. They will break down your walls and demolish your fine houses and throw your stones, timber, and rubble into the sea. I will put an end to your noisy songs, and the music of your harps will be heard no more. I will make you a bare rock, and you will become a place to spread fish nets. You will never be rebuilt, for I, the Lord, have spoken, declares the Sovereign Lord. And that is the end of the quote from Ezekiel chapter 26. Now, some of you may be familiar with this prophecy of Tyre. Years ago, the Moody Science Film Organization produced a film on this prophecy of Tyre and used it as sort of an apologetic argument for the fulfillment of prophecy and this theme of scripture that shows the existence and truthfulness of the God of Israel when he speaks in advance about things that were long-term to be fulfilled. It's often been cited as an example of a prophecy that was demonstrably fulfilled in a remarkable way. However, it's interesting that there are also people who use this prophecy in exactly the reverse sense, as an example of the unreliability of Old Testament prophecy, based on the claim that Ezekiel is demonstrably false in what he says will happen here. It historically didn't come to pass the way he said. If you look at that material I just gave you, page 50, there's an entry there from Gordon Oxtoby in his book Prediction and Fulfillment in the Bible, pages 79 and 80. Notice that he says the following, quote, 
But Nebuchadnezzar did not take Tyre. His siege failed. Ezekiel himself realized that this was the case and therefore made a new prediction at a later date in which he admitted that Nebuchadnezzar made his army labor hard against Tyre. Every head was made bald, every shoulder was rubbed bare, as Ezekiel tells us. Neither he nor his army got anything from Tyre to pay for the labor that he had performed against it. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will give the land of Egypt to Nebuchadnezzar, and he shall carry off his wealth and the spoil and plunder, and it shall be wages for his army. That's Ezekiel chapter 29, verses 18 and 19. Then Oxaby says, and I'm quoting again, It is a matter of sober historical record that we may add that the siege of Tyre lasted for about 13 years, from 585 to 572, but was unsuccessful. Part of Tyre was on an island half a mile offshore, now joined by a sand spit to the mainland. The Tyrians were able to hold off the enemy, that is Nebuchadnezzar, and eventually come to terms with him. But the city was not conquered or destroyed, never to be rebuilt as Ezekiel had previously predicted. So then you go back to the passage and you ask, Is that what it says? Is Ox to be right? What do we do about that? You see, Oxaby contends that Ezekiel was mistaken in predicting that Nebuchadnezzar would bring Tyre to its final end because the siege was not successful, and Nebuchadnezzar did not destroy the city. So the Tyrians eventually came to terms with Nebuchadnezzar, but the city was not conquered or destroyed as Ezekiel had predicted. But then the question is, did Ezekiel really say that Nebuchadnezzar would bring Tyre to its final end? If you look closer at the prophecy, there are several things to notice. I think it's true in chapter 26, verses 12 to 14, where it says, and I quote, They will plunder your wealth and loot your merchandise. They will break down your walls and demolish your fine houses and throw your stones, timber, and rubble into the sea. I will put an end to your noisy songs, and the music of your harps will be heard no more. I will make you a bare rock, and you will become a place to spread fish nets. You will never be rebuilt, for I the Lord have spoken, declares the Sovereign Lord. End quote. Then in verse 14, we quote again, I will make you a bare rock, and you will become a place to spread fish nets. You will never be rebuilt. End quote. Nebuchadnezzar did not fulfill the things in verses 12 to 14. He didn't take the merchandise, that's verse 12. He didn't set the debris of the city into the water, as we read in the latter part of verse 12, where it says they will break down your walls and demolish your fine houses and throw your stones and timber and rubble into the sea. Nebuchadnezzar did not do that. Then in verse 14 we read, he didn't level the city, like a top of a rock never to be rebuilt. But I think what Oxaby has done, even though I think that is clear, is to misread the text. If you go back earlier to verse 3, where it's introduced, notice it says, quote, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, I am against you, O Tyre, and I will bring many nations against you, like the sea casting up its waves. End quote. And then we have in verse 4, they, and I emphasize they, they will destroy the walls of Tyre and pull down her towers. End quote. That's many nations that are going to do that. So you might say, in fact, that Nebuchadnezzar had done it, then verses 3 and 4 would have been incorrect, because it would not have been many nations, as Ezekiel says, it would have been only one nation. But I think what happens in this prophecy is that Ezekiel, beginning with verse 7, speaks of Nebuchadnezzar as part of the succession of attacks against Tyre. And you notice with verse 7, where he says, quote, I will bring Nebuchadnezzar into Tyre, end quote. The pronoun switches from they, plural, to third masculine, singular. So that in verse 8 it says, quote, He shall slay with the sword thy daughters in the field, he shall make a fort against thee and cast a siege mount. End quote. Nebuchadnezzar did lay siege to Tyre. Quote again, he shall set engines of war against thy wall. End quote. And then verse 11, I'm quoting again, and you can tell I'm quoting from the King James, he shall slay thy people with the sword, thy strong garrison shall go down to the ground. End quote. So from verses 7 through 11, you have a third masculine singular, but in verses 12, it switches back to the plural. 
You see, in verse 12, it goes from he to they. It's the plural pronoun in 12, as it was in verse 4. When we read many nations, they shall destroy the walls. Then in verse 12, they will plunder your wealth and loot your merchandise. So I think in the prophecies of verses 12 to 14, which are the things that are not fulfilled by Nebuchadnezzar, what is in view is not just Nebuchadnezzar, but the many nations. That's where historically it is rather interesting to look at what actually happened to Tyre. I'm saying verses 3 and 4 speak of many nations as they, and then verses 7 through 11 speak specifically of Nebuchadnezzar. But then, with verse 12, it seems to switch back to they, or many nations. So you have a combination of a prophecy that concerns Nebuchadnezzar, but then other nations as well. All of these are combined together, and it's hard to sort them out. But I do think you switch from Nebuchadnezzar to the nations and back to Nebuchadnezzar and back to the nations in this prophecy. When you look at verses 12 to 14, you're back to the they, and particularly the last part of verse 12, where it says, They will break down your walls and demolish your fine houses and throw your stones, timber, and rubble into the sea. Historically, it's clear that that happened in 332 B.C. when Alexander the Great laid siege to Tyre. Tyre was composed of a mainland city and an island city off the mainland. Nebuchadnezzar had broken down the walls of the mainland city and killed many of the inhabitants, but a lot of the people fled to the island part of the city off the coast. They continued living there since he wasn't able to do anything about the island city. So that when Alexander comes to Tyre, that island city was still a thriving port while the mainland city was mainly in ruins. But the island city was still alive and well. Then you have this rather strange prophecy where we read, They shall lay your stones, your timber, and your dust in the midst of the water. Why would anybody do that? Well, look at page 49 of your citations. I have several paragraphs there from James Fries, Archaeology and the Bible. And I'm quoting, Ezekiel had prophesied that they will lay your stones, your timber, your dust in the midst of the water, and that Tyre would be made like a top of a rock, useful only as a place to spread nets upon. How amazing to take the worthless remains of a city and place them in the midst of the water. Surely the manpower could be put to a more useful task than that. The fulfillment, however, came in the campaign of Alexander against Tyre. When Alexander first approached the island city of Tyre, there was a willingness to surrender. But when he demanded permission to enter the city and offer worship at the temple of the god of Melkart, he was refused. The citizens of Tyre declined to accept his request on the grounds that they wished to remain neutral in the conflict between Macedonia and Persia. Alexander began a siege of the city and found it necessary to labor for seven months before capturing it. He determined to build a land bridge or mole using cedars from the Lebanon mountains as piles and the debris from the old land city as material for the mole. As the water became deeper further out, the difficulties of the workmen increased. They were also hindered in every possible way by the people of Tyre who had a good navy. In order to meet this challenge, Alexander left the construction of the mole to his army engineers and went north to collect ships, ships of Arabus and Byblos on the coast of Syria. He went to the kings of Arabus and Byblos, who placed their ships at his disposal. From the island of Cyprus, he was able to secure 120 ships and from Sidon about 80. With a fleet of some 220 warships, Alexander was more than a match for the sizable yet smaller fleet of the Tyrians. After seven months, the mole was brought up to the walls of the island city of Tyre. In August 332 BC, the wall was breached from the mole and part of the fleet of Tyre was sunk. With the capture of the city, thousands of the inhabitants were sold into the slave market. 13,000 according to Arius, the historian, 30,000 according to Diodorus, another historian. Ezekiel's prophecy concerning the laying of the stones, the timber, and the dust in the midst of the water was specifically fulfilled when Alexander's engineers 
built the mole and used the remains of the ancient city of Tyre, laying them in the midst of the water. And that's the end of the quote from Fee. So the end of verse 12 there, you find a remarkable fulfillment in the time of Alexander. However, verses 13 and 14 weren't really completely fulfilled, even at that point, because you read, quote, I will put an end to your noisy songs, and the music of your harps will be heard no more. I will make you a bare rock, and you will become a place to spread fish nets. You will never be rebuilt, for I, the Lord, have spoken, declares the Sovereign Lord. End quote. That was not the end of the city of Tyre in the time of Alexander, despite that conquest and his taking of the island city. The mainland city continued after that time, and an element of it remained. Alexander pretty much destroyed the island city, but there were still remnants of people there living at the site of the mainland city. Under the Seleucids, it recovered and it continued to exist under the Roman and even down into the time of Muslim control and the Crusaders' taking of the place. It was finally destroyed in 1292 by the Saracens. They were Arab Muslims in the early Middle Ages there, around 1292. It never recovered from that blow, and it has remained unoccupied to this very day. Now, look at page 48, bottom of the page. Unfortunately, the first sentence here was left out of the typing of this, but this is from an article on Tyre from the Encyclopedia Britannica. That quotation should begin this way, quote, The city passed successively under the sway of the Seleucids about 198 B.C. and the Romans, 68 B.C. Jesus visited the area of Tyre and Sidon, that's in Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 to 28, and Mark chapter 7, verses 24 to 31. Paul, the apostle, spent a week at Tyre with fellow Christians while a ship unloaded his cargo, that's in Acts chapter 21, verses 3 to 7, on his journey from Ephesus to Jerusalem. In Roman times, the city was famous for the manufacture of silk and silken garments, as well as from Tyrian purple, derived from the snails of the genus Murex. By the 2nd century AD, Tyre had become the see of a bishop. The scholar Origen was buried there about 254 AD. Eusebius of Caesarea delivered a sermon there on God's creation in 323 AD. In 638, the city was captured by Muslims. It was taken by the Crusaders in 1124. The Holy Roman Emperor Frederick I Barbarossa drowned in 1190 there and was buried in the Crusaders' Cathedral. In 1291, the Muslims recaptured and destroyed the city, and that was the end of the city of Tyre in 1291. And that's from the Encyclopedia Britannica. So you see, as far as fulfillment of the prophecy of Ezekiel is concerned, beginning at verse 3 and 4, and I quote again, many nations are going to come up against you. They shall destroy Tyre, end quote. You have a fulfillment through the ages of many nations, indeed, coming against Tyre. Verses 13 and 14, ultimately, it's they that will cause the sound of the harps to cease and make it like the top of a rock, never again to be inhabited. So, you see, fulfillment is a long succession of Nebuchadnezzar, Alexander, the Romans, the Muslims, the Crusaders, until it's finally destroyed. Today, it is not an inhabited site. Now, just one final note, and we'll take a break. In contrast to that prophecy against Tyre, look at the prophecy against Sidon, which is the sister city of Tyre. That's in chapter 28, verse 21 and following, where we read, Son of man, set your face against Sidon. Prophesy against her and say, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I am against you, O Sidon, and I will gain glory within you. They will know that I am the Lord when I inflict punishment on her and show myself holy within her. I will send a plague upon her and make blood flow in her streets. The slain will fall within her with the sword against her on every side. Then they will know that I am the Lord. End quote. Sidon is the sister city to Tyre. The prophecy against Tyre predicts eradication of the city never to be rebuilt. 
But in the case of Sidon, Ezekiel says there's going to be a squatter in the streets. He says nothing about Sidon's being eradicated as a city, never to be rebuilt. There's going to be blood in the streets. The interesting thing is, today, if you go to the Phoenician coast, which is in Lebanon, of course, you will find that Sidon is still an inhabited city. Sidon continues in existence with a population of about 50,000 people. It's a prominent place. Tyre on the coast is unoccupied. So again, I think in this, you do have an example of a remarkable prediction that shows the existence and veracity of the God of biblical revelation. To sum it up, Ezekiel was correct, Oxtaby was wrong. This ends lecture number 25 of the Major Prophets by Robert Benoit, specifically the first lecture on Ezekiel.